have insisted more from our laws, right? Could we have expected more from our communities? And what can we do now? We have to pick the pieces up and we've got to believe in an America that's as good as its promise and work to achieve it. And I will talk about the other rights, but I think it's really important. It's not that there's some day in the future that these rights are going to be under attack. I think one of the best things that the far right, from their perspective, has probably done in this country was to convince people for many years that democracy did not require a fight. Democracy mm. has always been the type of thing, there are always going to be people that are um, opposed to everyone being able to enjoy and live their lives and have opportunity. There will always be that tinge of a movement. And if you ever take it for granted, that's where we get in trouble. The Love and Order Podcast. With your host, Laurier L'Amour. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The opinions expressed on this podcast are not legal advice that can be relied on. They are based solely on the limited information provided. These opinions do not create any attorney-client relationship. Those seeking legal advice should contact an attorney in the appropriate jurisdiction and practice area. Welcome to today's episode, and I know the devastating decision in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, in which the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, stripping millions of women of the constitutional right to an abortion, has so many of us feeling hopeless and confused. And if there's one person on earth who can give all of us hope and who cares about the state of our democracy, it is today's guest, Sky. Perryman. Sky is the CEO and president of Democracy Forward, an organization that was introduced to me by one of my amazing supporters, Tatiana. Sky is an expert and advocate on reproductive rights. And in this episode, we talk about the impacts of the Dobbs decision, what we need to do to fight abortion bans, and how the attacks on abortion access are threats to democracy as a whole. I want to encourage you to listen to the episode all the way through because Sky has a delicious way of getting us all out of our 4th of July funk. So thank you to Tatiana and please rate, review and subscribe. And I hope that you enjoy this episode. Hi, Sky. Thank you so much for being with us today. How are you? I'm doing okay, all things considered. Um, So tell us about your background and how you first got involved with Democracy Forward. Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, I am a lawyer and um, had a career in corporate legal practice in Washington, D.C. I practiced at two law firms, handled a range of matters for um, many clients in the healthcare industry and the financial services industry, um, and also maintained a really active pro bono public interest legal practice while doing that work. And um, in 2016, Uh, in the aftermath of the 2016 election, when it became clear that our country was entering a really new era, um, that uh, President Trump and his movement had gained outsized amount of political power, uh, I had an opportunity to um, leave my firm to come to a new organization that no one had ever heard about. There was no sign, there was no website called Democracy Forward, and um, to use the law in order to stop unlawful behavior and help people in communities who we knew, based on what um, President-elect Trump at the time had said, were going to be the victim of many uh, bad and unlawful policies. And so it was a decision that was like one of those pivots in your life. Uh, Took a step off my uh, corporate law practice that I really did love, um, but thought that this was really where I could be engaged and do my um, highest and best work. So I came to Democracy Forward in 2017, helped start the organization, brought several early cases against the Trump administration, worked with tremendous colleagues who had also uh, stepped off their careers in order to come do this work at the time. And about a year into my being at Democracy Forward, I ended up going to the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, which is the nation's largest association of physicians dedicated to the health of women, in order to help address um, threats to reproductive health care, to equitable maternity care, and to women's health generally. And so I was there for about three years. And then um, in the wake of January 6th, and when it was clear that the threats for democracy were not going away, but in fact were becoming more prevalent, uh, I came back to Democracy Forward as its president and CEO in order to expand our organization's work into the states and local governments, uh, as well as into the federal regulatory process. 
Wow. So I only got PTSD from the Trump administration and you got an entirely new career. <laughs> I cannot even, I cannot even handle it. I am so, so impressed. So democracy forward, how do you choose what cases you're going to take on? Right. So um, we use the law uh, to fight for good government on behalf of all Americans. And so in the Trump administration, what that meant was that we were principally focused on challenging unlawful and harmful behavior from uh, that administration. And we are a collaborative organization. We are here to force multiply and to support all of the tremendous work that's being done across the country with many organizations. So we do not seek to duplicate the work of others. But what we know is that the threats to democracy are so intense at this time that there's a lot of work that the existing sort of legal infrastructure could not handle. And so we go into those gap areas and um, we help people and communities in those areas. Since since the Trump administration um, left office and we're seeing threats to democracy in states and communities throughout the country, um, we still have that be our guiding uh, principle. So um, we will go and take on cases where people are getting harmed from unlawful and anti-democratic conduct, where other people um, either aren't there to challenge it or need help challenging it. Wow. So did you know Obviously, we had the draft opinion from the Supreme Court, right? The first leaked, I believe it was the first leaked draft opinion ever, right? We had that come out. Did you know before that, was there something in the air that told you Roe v. Wade might be overturned and it might be overturned in a few months? So I think for many of us, who have um, been working at the intersection of women's health and the law. And I did a lot of that work when I was in corporate practice, pro bono mm -hmm. for reproductive health providers and abortion providers for medical groups. And then of course my work at the American College of OBGYNs and then now at Democracy Forward. I think for many of us that have been watching um, what's happened through the courts, it has been very clear for some time that there was a movement in the country that was seeking an outsized amount of political power that had a goal, a stated goal, an announced goal of overturning decades of precedent that protects um, women's rights, people's rights and privacy rights. And so um, it obviously we're all, I think, still experiencing the aftermath of the Dobbs decision coming down. And of course, folks that are in states where abortion is restricted or banned um, are really experiencing those um, uh, effects. Uh, but I do think that for many of us, this was something that we knew um, that there was a movement to do. And, um, and here we are. Right. So the, there is an interesting case that you told me about um, against the city of Lebanon in Ohio, where Democracy Forward, again, a collaborative effort with other organizations, sued the city of Lebanon um, over an abortion ban, right? And you didn't rely on Roe v. Wade at all in arguing against the ban. Can you tell us about that? Sure. So um, prior to uh, the Dobbs decision, which was the decision that overturned Roe v. Wade, and I know your listeners know that, prior to that decision, throughout the country for many years, as a result of many lawsuits that have restricted the right to abortion or that have upheld restrictions in states, there are many people in this country that could not access health care. And I think that's a really important thing for us to remember, because many people are feeling the effects of Dobbs and thinking about what it means for Roe to be overturned. But what we know is that as a result of um, structural inequities, economic inequities, um, and many other inequities in the country, including geographic regions where abortion has been restricted for some time, many people have not been able to access health care. In addition to that, we saw a movement a few years ago, I believe beginning in around 2018, 2019, a right wing movement out of um, uh, out of Texas that sought to go into cities and counties throughout the country and pass city ordinances or laws that purport to ban abortion and that purport to penalize, in some cases civilly penalize, in other cases criminally penalize, people who have a role in helping one access care. If this sounds familiar to you, 
It probably does because it probably found, sounds familiar to the um, things that you've heard about SB8 in Texas. Uh, these city ordinances came out of the same movement that SB8 came out of. The same people are behind it. And um, for many reasons, in part because of all the threats to reproductive health care, um, many of these bans have not been challenged, had not been challenged in court. And so um, in Lebanon, Ohio, uh, we heard from social workers who um, are on the ground in Lebanon who work there that this ban was um, a real threat to them, that um, it could potentially penalize them for helping people, for doing their jobs um, consistent with their um, clinical responsibilities to their clients. We heard from folks at an abortion fund, um, Women Have Options in Ohio, a community organization, that, um, and these are, they don't provide health care, they're helping people access care. This ban presented a real threat to them and their ability to help their community and do their jobs. And so we, along with the ACLU of Ohio, brought a case and we filed that case after the leaked opinion, but before Dobbs came out. And the case relies on arguments that don't depend on Roe versus Wade. And so you might ask, what are those arguments? Well, as we know, um, in a democracy, our constitution protects people from draconian laws. We have freedom of speech. We have um, procedural protections. If you're going to criminalize someone, you have to put them on notice. We have um, protections that say that laws cannot be too vague, that you have to be able to know what the law is in order to be able to figure out what it is. And then there are also state laws in states like Ohio. So our case relied on the um, uh, various constitutional protections at the federal level and an Ohio state, uh, an Ohio state law um, to challenge that, that ban. Okay. So there are so many questions about what is going to happen to those people who are assisting those in getting abortions and those who are getting abortions. I've been tagged hundreds of times in this one TikTok that I, that I sent you, and I've since been told that some of the information in that TikTok is actually incorrect. So I'm popping in here very quickly just to show you the TikTok we're talking about. And again, I have not fact-checked the laws in Alabama, so we're just going to focus on the question that is being asked. But if you're joining us just on audio and not watching the YouTube, in the first few seconds, there is text on the screen that says, abortion is now a felony felons cannot vote. Again, if you're listening on audio, you won't be able to hear the text at all, obviously. But here's the TikTok. I would like a lawyer, um, a good one, to answer my question, because I cannot find any sources that answer it. In my state, Alabama, receiving, not just performing, receiving an abortion is a crime, a felony, not just any felony, a class A felony. And in my state, Felons cannot vote. However, the only people that can actually commit that crime are people who are born with female reproductive anatomy, which is unique because it's the only crime that can be committed by a single biological sex classification. Now, here it says that Jane Roe uh, used the 1st, 4th, 5th, 9th, and 14th Amendments to argue her case in that abortion was a constitutional right. And the court decided that the due process clause of the 14th Amendment protected against state action to the right of privacy and a woman's right to have choose to have an abortion falls within that right to privacy. The 19th Amendment was never mentioned. So my question is, if a state makes it a felony to get an abortion and felons cannot vote in that state and there's only one biological sex that could commit the crime of abortion, would that not also violate the 19th Amendment? You know, this question, I have to say, I love, I love whoever came up with the, whatever <laughs> person, I love this person because they're <laughs> thinking about the important issues in democracy. And so I could break this down in a bunch of different ways, right? Because um, there are debates about whether people who are incarcerated should be able to vote. Mm. Um, they, are, they are, in fact, people in a democracy that should be able to vote, right? I mean, there are debates about that. Yeah. There are, um, we, we thought we settled a debate about women being able to vote and about women being sort of equal people in society, but maybe we're, um, maybe we're kind of hearkening back to a different time. So, so your question raises a lot of things. But um, what I will, um, and I appreciate the spirit of it. I, I think what I'll say is two things. I mean, one is I think there is a very serious um, sense um, that laws that restrict or ban abortion disproportionately harm women. We know that because women, by and large, 
are the people that get abortion. Of course, we do know that there are people who do not identify as women, but that nevertheless get pregnant and require reproductive health care, including abortion. And abortion right. um, abortion helps those people too, right? So, so, so an inclusive view. Um, the other thing we know is that those restrictions also disproportionately affect uh, people of color and um, communities because of structural inequities. Um, and so uh, I think that now that we are in a place where there is a movement in this country that is seeking to dismantle our democracy and that is seeking to dismantle decades of precedent, I like the fact that your um, listeners are thinking about what should a democracy affirm and what is a democracy that's as good as its promise and why can't our jurisprudence recognize everyone and the equal dignity of everyone and the ability of everyone to participate in society. And yes, voting is very important, but also being able to go about your life and pursue your happiness and make decisions about the most intimate matters in your life are really important. And that's what, um, unfortunately, we saw a real setback for that idea of democracy last Friday. Uh, but I do have some hope because I see what your listeners are putting up and I see what everyone um, is doing out in their communities that we could potentially get that back. And so that's what we're focused on at Democracy Forward. I love that. We saw, well, we saw in the con concurring opinion in Dobbs that Justice Thomas opened the door for challenges on other rights we rely on. And we just touched on that, but it includes the right to use birth control, equal marriage. How concerned should we be about these rights being attacked and what do we do to protect them? I think we should be very concerned. And I think that it's not that they are going to be attacked. They are being attacked and they have been being attacked. And if, if Dobbs could teach us one lesson, these attacks on abortion, calls to overturn Roe versus Wade, they didn't start at the beginning of the Dobbs case. Mm -hmm. They have been making their way through the court system and through cultural and political life for many years. And everyone that feels outraged now, that is out looking at what they can do, we also have to ask ourselves the really hard question of what could we have done? Mm. Could we have stood up in those difficult moments? Could we have insisted more from our leaders? Could we have insisted more from our laws, right? Could we have expected more from our communities? And what can we do now? We have to pick the pieces up and we've got to believe in an America that's as good as its promise and work to achieve it. And I will talk about the other rights, but I think it's really important. It's not that there's some day in the future that these rights are going to be under attack. I think one of the best things that the far right from their perspective has probably done in this country was to convince people for many years that democracy did not require a fight. Democracy mm. has always been the type of thing. There are always going to be people that are um, opposed to everyone being able to enjoy and live their lives and have opportunity. There will always be that tinge of a movement. And if you ever take it for granted, that's where we get in trouble. And so with respect to these rights on contraception, I think there's a, you know, some very um, concerning, you know, this as a lawyer, but um, the cases that came before Roe versus Wade, the Supreme Court cases we used to have in this country where um, medical professionals could be jailed um, mm -hmm. for talking about family planning, for distributing, um, for distributing uh, uh, contraception. Uh, those were the various cases. Um, there were laws called um, Comstock laws that um, prohibited um, the distribution of contraception. And the cases that overturned those laws were cases that relied on a right to privacy. And Roe versus Wade was based on those cases. And so I think that it is not, um, uh, doesn't take too much of an imagination to understand um, that all of these things are related. With respect to um, uh, equal marriage, and I'll say, you know, we had um, Loving versus Virginia, which is, was around um, interracial marriage. And then, of course, later decisions around gay marriage. Um, I, you know, these are decisions, again, that I think that we need to be very concerned um, that there are people in this country who, for whatever reason, uh, believe that the government should have, you know, a role in restricting the ability of who to love and who to partner with, of when and how to have children, of whether to take birth control medication. I mean, these are all very um, concerning things. Um, and so um, I think we should be concerned. I think we've got to um, remember that these are hard fought battles. And I think we've got to get in there and um, try to push forward. So why do you think Roe fell? How did we get here almost 50 years later? 
Well, I mean, I think there are, um, you know, I think lots of folks will have different accounts and I'm not an expert in all of it. But what I will say is that we have seen a highly coordinated, well-resourced, aggressive and harmful effort by far right legal organizations um, to push a jurisprudence, to push an idea of democracy, to push an idea of the Constitution that is one that is narrow and rigid and doesn't represent um, the ability of people to pursue happiness, the equal dignity of people that we believe is enshrined in our constitutional order here in America. And so I think that that is one of the things. This was a very calculated effort, um, persistent effort by a movement that has gained an outsized amount of political power. I think it's also important to look at the composition of, you know, we need to expect more from our government. We need to look at who our judges are and ask hard questions. Um, you know, do you believe in democracy? Do you believe that all people um, deserve equal dignity? Do you believe that the government should be able to um, criminalize a physician for helping someone get reproductive health care that we know one in four women will need in their adult life. I mean, those are the questions that we should be asking. And I think we should, um, you know, ask them in the future. And I think um, uh, hopefully that this situation gets people thinking about what they can do to help make sure that this doesn't happen again and to restore rights to women in America. Roe versus Wade is an incredibly important decision in American legal history, right? Um, it overturned laws that were criminalizing doctors, that were criminalizing people for seeking and providing health care. But that's not where we should, that shouldn't be our dream. That's not where we should stop. Right. We need to make sure that people throughout this country can decide if and when and how to get pregnant, that people that can't afford to, um, that have infertility issues, that want to be a parent, are able to access health care so that they can address those issues and be a parent without having to work a job where they make, you know, um, where they make a large salary because many people don't. Um, we need to make sure that people can access health care and not have to worry about, you know, which type of insurance plan they're on, right? We need to be, we need to make sure that people that raise their kids get to raise their kids in communities that aren't beset by gun violence violence or, um, you know, or other types of issues that we're facing in the country. And so what I would suggest is that we just need to expect more um, of all of our elected leaders and of ourselves and of our country. And if we if we're determined that way and if we work that way as a community and as a movement, I do think that we can build from where we are now into a better tomorrow. Wow, that's that's really you know, it really drives home the point that we, I know everyone feels hopeless, but there's so much more that we can do that maybe we're just not even aware of, right? Because people often focus on action at the federal level, right? But it's really important that we engage in pushing for good pol policies and against harmful ones and at the state and local level, and right? So, and at the federal. Look, we need to expect and at the federal, we, right. in, in democracy, we need to expect that our government represents the people. And we need to expect that our government, whether it's a federal government, whether it's a court, whether it's a state and local government, are sort of, you know, um, come together around basic principles that all people are created equally, that people have some liberty and freedom over their own lives, that people need to be able to pursue their own happiness and their own dreams. And the things that are the threat to that are threats to democracy because they are threats to people. And so that's how I'm viewing, you know, what has happened here is another incredibly tragic example of what happens when the government does not um, do the work of the people and doesn't um, affirm basic principles of democracy. And so it's a very sad time, I think. Um, but I think that there is, we have to have hope because um, those that um, those that aren't sad about what happened last Friday um, would want you to believe that there's nothing you can do because then, um, then they can continue with an agenda that is restrictive and that is narrow and that is harmful and that does not represent the best of what we know we can be. Yeah, I still, you know, we're, we're, one week out from the decision. And I still, every time I talk about this topic, I need to take a second and breathe and just 
think, you know, thank God I live in California, but does that even matter when there's other people in the world now who cannot gain access to abortion? Yeah. So where we come in is um, we believe that local communities and that people in communities deserve a voice at all levels of government. And mm -hmm. so when there are issues at the federal level where folks throughout the country may not um, have the tools to weigh in in the regulatory process, we represent community-based groups and other organizations and people um, in making their voices heard. So um, that's one thing. And you can go to our website and learn about the types of things that we're working on and get in touch with us at democracyforward.org if there are things that you, um, you know, are wondering about or would like to see us work on. Um, but what we also do is, of course, we use the law as a, as a, as a um, tool for change. And so we will challenge unlawful and harmful activity at the state and local level. We did that in Lebanon, Ohio. We filed a case this week in Wisconsin um, that's not related to abortion, but related to um, the um, uh, efforts to uh, efforts to um, subvert um, the election and hide sort of documents around um, that issue. So, so, you know, government transparency issues. So we will bring those cases to challenge bad behavior and to use the law in order to empower communities to um, advance democracy in this country. So that's the kind of thing you can see um, from us at the state and local level generally. And during the pandemic, you also helped in an effort to provide access to medication abortion, right? Yes. So um, I had the honor of being the general counsel of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Um, which represents over 60,000 um, uh, physicians and partners in women's health that are caring for women. In the pandemic, um, the Trump administration, the FDA lifted um, restrictions on medications that often cannot be sent through the mail. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Medications that for whatever reason cannot be sent through the mail, they lifted them so that people could access them safely at home when, they were ex when we were experiencing a global pandemic. And there was a striking exception to um, the medic to uh, what FDA uh, the Trump era FDA did in that time, and they did not lift um, the restriction at the time on mifepristone, which is the medication otherwise known as the medication abortion pill. And so um, ACOG, along with Sister Song and um, other organizations, brought a case against FDA. Um, in because again, we need to expect that our government will do the work of the people. And so ACOG brought a case against FDA uh, during the pandemic um, that led to a six month injunction um, where, and that means blocking, where um, the medication abortion pill was available by mail. The medical community for many years um, has known and the research has de de uh, demonstrably shown that um, medication abortion is incredibly safe and effective and that there is no reason that it cannot be um, safely and effectively administered through the mail. And so um, and so the, uh, the restriction was lifted during the pandemic. During that time, we saw what the medical community has long known, which is that it's safe and effective. The data was generated during that time. And um, the Supreme Court on its shadow docket, and we can talk about the shadow docket if you ever want to talk about the shadow docket, but the Supreme Court on its shadow docket a few days before President Biden took office blocked that injunction without any oral argument. Um, and so that's actually the first case that the Supreme Court, that this particular Supreme Court took um, on abortion. It was not the Dobbs case. It was um, the ACOG, the FDA was on the shadow docket at the beginning of the year, uh, beginning of 2021, blocked it. And then um, the Biden administration's FDA, um, at the request of the medical community, lifted um, uh, the restriction again. And now, um, after a full review of evidence, has um, said that they will permanently lift that restriction. So um, what that means is that people can access medication abortion, um, if they're a good candidate for it, if their doctor thinks they're a good candidate you know, for it, through the mail in some states, um, uh, where uh, in some states, there's a sort of a mosaic of state laws, but it is, um, it, it was a, a really good um, sort of incremental but, but important um, advancement for women's health care. Wow. Okay. Tell us about the shadow docket. I want to know everything. <laughs> From the look on your face, I know you want to talk about it. Well, I, mean, you know, I think, look, I think, you know, um, and you know this, because you know this from law school and from being a lawyer. I mean, you know, we, we expect um, that when we expect that our courts will explain um, 
the basis for their decisions, right? You remember that term from law school, folks on took, you know, called reasoned elaboration, right? Mm -hmm. We ex expect that um, that is what the court process does and that's what it does. And what we've seen is a number of instances um, where the court has um, on the shadow docket um, taken cases and um, made decisions, sometimes not um, wading in, not having oral argument, not um, explaining their decisions. And this is uh, very concerning. And a lot of legal scholars, there's a legal scholar at the University of Texas named Steve Vladek, um, who's written a lot about this and who has studied the shadow docket. Um, and a lot of legal scholars um, and others are incredibly concerned about what this means for our democracy and for our court. I want to know, yeah. Oh, I want to know at the Democracy Forward offices, when Roe v. Wade was overturned, what did you guys do? What were you guys thinking? I know obviously you knew it was going to happen, like you said, but what was the reaction? Because you have a lot of uh, younger people working there as well, right? I know Tatiana works there, right? I want to know just the reaction there because the reaction between my colleagues and I, right, who are all my friends, all a bunch of lawyers, we just got on FaceTime and we're like, what the fuck just happened? what like it really happened oh god and then people started asking oh it's just a distraction they're trying to distract us from other issues right i want to know what people who are really deep into this work were thinking the second the decision came down um it was a really dark day yeah um you know uh we had team members that had to take the day off mm. um, we had team members that were um you know crying and upset. I mean, you know, this is um, for lawyers. I mean, it was, it's devastating. It's devastating for women. It's devastating for people and communities. It's devastating for democracy. It's very devastating for lawyers because I think what we know is that our country has never been a perfect one and that there um, were massive original sins. We know that about the country, but that what we've always been able to see is that um, there are have been efforts to form a more perfect union and to make us better than we were before and to push us forward. And so what happened last Friday was a setback, right? It's a setback on the arc. It is a, it is a real visual and tangible and real um, demonstration of the extreme threats that we are seeing to democracy at this time. That's terrifying for people. And then, of course, we have people. Um, we have people on our team. I have a person on my team that lives in Mississippi um, whose wife works in the reproductive health care context. I have um, folks on my team who have worked with doctors before. Uh, we have people who, you know, we have people with all different experiences, people who have required reproductive health care, people who have required abortion, people who um, require, um, you know, we have all, all type, you know, all kinds of people on our staff. And so I think just like the rest of America responded, um, is what we saw at the Democracy Forward offices. It's, it was no less devastating for those, even those who sort of have, um, you know, who, who have some legal background. Mm. Are you able to summarize for our audience the Dobbs decision and the and the case just in general, and just elaborate about on the state of our democracy in the U.S. now? Well, so the Dobbs decision itself um, was a case that went up to the Supreme Court um, around Mississippi's, um, the legislature in Mississippi's decision to ban abortion after 15 weeks. And um, but in it, you know, embedded in the case it was sort of a question about whether the doctrine recognized in Roe versus Wade and in Casey versus Planned Parenthood uh, was, you know, should be overturned. And um, you saw a majority of uh, six justices um, overturned uh, that longstanding precedent. So that's the Dobbs decision. In terms of our democracy, um, I think that we are really, <laughs> it's not, it, it's a, we are at a really critical inflection point. And, um, uh, and, you know, we have right now in the country a movement um, that is, does not represent the majority of Americans that do not, do not come close to representing the majority of Americans, um, but that has been consistent, well-coordinated mm -hmm. and aggressive, unethical, and has done anything they could do to um, obtain an outsized amount of political power. That is antithetical 
to a democracy? How did it get there? Voter suppression laws, voter intimidation tactics, right? Um, lo lots of other things too. Um, decisions to deprive President Obama of a sitting nominee for the Supreme Court, right? Many mm. democratic norms over the past years have been obstructed. And, um, and we're seeing this throughout the country in states and communities. And so I think we are at a really critical point where we all have to be looking within ourselves and within our families and within our communities and asking, what are we going to do to advance democracy at this time? Because we are coming dangerously close to what could be the last chapter of American democracy. I don't believe that last chapter has been written yet. I believe in the power of people and the collective power of people. We see it every day at Democracy Forward. We see what happens when people come together and demand more and ask more and expect more. We see that through the courts. We see that in um, the regulatory process. We see that th throughout. But we are at a critical point. So if anybody's listening and you're wondering sort of like, what do I do? I mean, we all have to get focused on what we are going to do in this time to expect more and to require that America be a democracy that is as good as its promise. And what are some actions that we can take to get us there? I think um, there is a, a lot folks can do. And I think that's like a really hopeful thing. I mean, one is um, we've got to be vigilant and educated about what is going on in the country, okay? And that doesn't just mean doom scrolling on Twitter, right? It means we need to go to news sources that are reliable, um, read them, understand what's going on, listen to what's happening in our communities, listen to people, and be very vigilant about that because there is a lot of misinformation and there are many resources, and you can go to our website, there are many resources there about sort of, um, you know, how to engage. Um, two, I think that like your voice matters. And whether that is writing a letter to the editor, whether that is asking questions of an elected representative, whether that is saying this is wrong. I mean, think about the social workers in Lebanon, Ohio, mm. who are suing the city because it has done something that is anti-democratic and harmful to people. Okay. People can be part of these, and that's what we do at Democracy Forward, right? We, we enable the law to be used by communities and citizens throughout the country in order to make positive change. So think about these types of things um, and I think, and, and get engaged. I think voting, we know voting's important and encouraging people to vote is always important. Um, see what you can do there. I will say something just because of the moment and you asked me to come on and talk about Dobbs. I do think that with respect to abortion care in particular, um, if you're, I'm sure your listeners all know what an abortion fund is, but just in case um, folks don't, abortion funds are organizations that help people get to care. So if you're in a state um, where abortion is restricted or where it is banned, abortion funds will help equip people with resources to get care that they need, right? Whether that's travel funds, whether that's administrative costs, whatever those things, whatever those types of things are. So there are many abortion funds that we are asking, you know, folks that care about reproductive health care are asking folks to be sure if you have a list of donations to make sure that you're directing your donations towards abortion funds, because they're going to be um, the groups that are going to be able to help people that don't have the economic means to access their health care. It is a problem that we're in this place in the country where we're having to rely on communities to help people access their care. But that's where we are. And you can be part of those communities. And for democracy, I think, um, you know, get engaged, be educated, vote, help others vote. Don't say, well, I don't have anything to do. I just, I'm just a teacher. I'm just a lawyer. I'm just a surgeon. I'm just a this. I'm just, no, we all have a role to play and go to democracyforward.org and sign up. And we have a lot of engagement opportunities as well. Are there any, um, political figures <laughs> that are on the upcoming ballots, November, you know, just ongoing that you think are an absolute threat to democracy and others that you think could be very helpful to the cause? I'm going to answer that this way. I'm going to say that anybody that doesn't believe in the right of people to be able to vote 
that doesn't believe in people's equal dignity or the ability of people to make decisions about their personal lives, I'm going to say that that type of activity, that type of mindset is a threat to democracy. Um, and um, so I think we need to demand more and we need to um, ask and be sure that we're educated on all of the issues. And um, and I think that like the American people are good at when they get educated at deciding. But we really need to make sure that folks are out and voting and um, and making educated votes. Yes, educated votes. That's that's the thing you don't often see on uh, social media in the comments. I mean, what can you say to someone when you're attempting to argue or debate or attempting to educate them? They cannot hear you. They don't understand. And I'll say this. A lot of them are very highly educated. Yep. But they are still on that side. So I think that, you know, I grew up, you were talking about California. Um, I grew up in Waco, Texas, um, which is a place where um, a lot of folks uh, in my hometown have different views than I do. Not all of them. Many of them have similar views, but a, a lot of us are different and we can all get along and we can all yep. find common ground. And I think that um, I think that here here's the thing people can have whatever view they want to have about any number of moral and ethical issues, whether to eat meat, whether to um, eat pork, whether to, um, uh, you know, uh, whether to go to church, whether not to go to church, whether to pray, whether to not pray, right? I mean, there are any number of issues that we, and decisions that we make about our personal lives all the time that, um, that we have the freedom to make. And there are people that make some decisions and maybe some people think those decisions are immoral, right? Maybe, maybe somebody thinks that if you drink, it's immoral, or if you, um, you know, if you live with someone, it's immoral. I mean, you know, right. There are any number of these things that people can have their own moral codes. And, um, and that's really not the debate that's, that, that is relevant when you're talking about a democracy, right? Because we understand that people are different and that everyone's going to see things differently. The debate in a democracy is what is required of the government. Mm. If we allow the government to make decisions about people's intimate lives, to criminally penalize them if they disagree with them. That is not the type of government that we um, ascribe to a democracy, right? And so I think that that when I'm talking, you know, there are people that have deeply held personal beliefs about any number of social right. issues, Even abortion. Any number of social issues. There are some people that don't think that IVF is right. appropriate, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are some people that don't think it's appropriate, you know, to um, for people to live together before they're married. There are some people that don't think it's appropriate. I mean, there, there's all kinds of issues out there, right? But the point is not that we have to see eye to eye on our moral compasses. What would that be in a society if everybody if everybody ascribed to the same view? That would be a pretty boring society. The point is that the government shouldn't make that decision for us. And I think that when I, and sometimes you can't, you know, I always say you can't reason people into positions they didn't reason their way, their way <laughs> out of positions they can't reason their way into. But I mean, I do think that like, you know, I, I think that that's really where you can try to start trying to find some common ground. I love that. That is such an eloquent and fair way to speak on that topic. And I know, you know, we've mentioned it already. People feel so hopeless. I've gotten comments that say, and people wonder why we think voting doesn't do anything. So what can you say to give people hope? What can we do? Because we all feel like poop, right? We don't feel good. Well, this is what I'll say. And, you know, um, this is not a country this is not like the first time that the Supreme Court has done something that undermines the equal dignity of all people or the values of our country, right? This is a court that handed down decisions like Dred Scott, like Plessy versus Ferguson, many other decisions that folks, you know, forget about over the years, Bowers versus Hardwick. I mean, this is not, um, this is not something that we haven't seen before. Um, we've seen it in presidencies. We've seen it in Congress. We've seen it in the court. We've seen governments not do what they need to do in order to um, uphold the values that we hold dear in a democracy and in order to protect people, right? That is American history. Mm. So the question then is what do we do when that happens? And the American story is a story of people that when the government has failed to live up to its promise, 
people have risen up and they have demanded more and they have believed that they're um, that they deserve more, that their communities deserve more, that their kids deserve more, that the future deserves more and have worked to achieve a country that is as good as its promise. And so I don't know if that's hope. I think it's sort of determination um, and should hopefully motivate people that um, this country has been through very dark times before. It is incredibly troubling that we are having to have this discussion in 2022. It is incredibly troubling. And we are at a time where this is not just basic disagreements among people. This is disagreements about people's humanity, about the very democratic values do, you know, of the country on, on a lot of different levels. So this is very, very concerning. But um, what we know is that people do have the power to use their voices to affect change if they're determined and demand more. And we need to demand more of all of our institutions. We need to demand more of ourselves. And we need to ask ourselves these hard questions. What could we have done? And how will we make sure that we'll never have to ask those questions again? And so I think that's that's what I would say. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. Demand more of yourselves. I think if we if we start there with every issue, we'll get to a beautiful place eventually, right? I think that I think that's such a great great point. And speaking of feeling like poop, very very serious topic that we're talking about today, but I know Sky that you have a recipe that can get anyone out of a depressive mood. And I want to hear about it. <laughs> me they're very depressed about the fourth of july yeah and of course i understand that but i think again you know let's let it be motivating what is this country if not a story of people that have pushed for more that have demanded more that have sought to achieve more that's what we need to be doing and reflecting this fourth of july Mm -hmm. And so um, that's what we need to be doing. And um, I do. I have a peach cobbler recipe from my grandmother. Oh, um, wow. And I had two grandmothers. I had one grandmother that made everything from scratch. This is not her peach cobbler recipe. Okay. I had another grandmother that was a little more practical. She worked <laughs> and she sort of, she was a little more practical and she didn't make everything from scratch. Okay. So I'm feeling down in the dumps and I need to make something for like the 4th of July, mm -hmm. but I don't. So, you know, to me, mom's recipes, which were all, you know, in this box, which were all, oh, how I go to my other grandmother's recipes. And so I've got a very quick peach cobbler and we'll also get it to you. But if anybody's listening, okay, yes. half a cup of margarine or butter. Okay. They said margarine back then because it was a little cheaper, but half mm. a cup of butter, two cups of sugar, four cups of sliced peaches. And guess what? You can use the ones in the can. Love it. A cup of Bisquick. And a cup of milk. And you put your cup of sugar and your peaches and, and butter in one bowl. And you put your other cup of sugar, your cup of Bisquick, and your milk in another bowl. And you mix them all up. And you dump them in a pan that's well greased. And you bake it. You don't stir it. You bake it in the oven at 375 for 30 minutes. And that crust will come up. And you'll have gooey sugary peaches and you go get some ice cream and you are good to go even if you're down in the dumps. Oh my God. I'm making this. I am making this. So it my plan, it, it sounds so delicious. I eat those peaches out of the can. Well, okay. first of all, you don't have, you know, you don't, you know, we, you don't, you know, this is a time in American society. We may have, you know, lost a constitutional right, but people are really into farm to table and that's great. So you don't have to use the canned peaches. You can use the fresh peaches or you can use the canned peaches in a pinch. Either no way. No shame. No shame. I am in a little bit of a canned peaches this quick mood because that's about the energy I have to dedicate to cooking right now, given all the other troubles that are going on. So I'm going to be using the canned peaches and the bisquick and the milk and butter, sugar, pour it in, and you're going to have a great peach cobbler. Gosh, I so love you, it. You can post it up or something. I'm definitely, I'm definitely posting that recipe because Fourth of July, we may not want to celebrate, but it's worth listening to this episode, making that peach cobbler, and finding Sky all over social media. Where can people find you and learn more about Democracy Forward? Okay, so Democracy Forward, you can follow us on Twitter. That's the hashtag is Democracy FWD. Democracy FWD. FWD. I'm Sky Perryman on Twitter. Very easy to find. The only one out there at Sky Perryman on Twitter. So Democracy <laughs> FWD, 
Sky Perryman, both on Twitter. Uh, and then you should go to democracyforward.org and you should sign up. We do not spam people. We do not send people, not every single day. Okay, this is me talking. You know, I'm like, every single day, you're not going to wake up to like doom scroll. We do not do that, but we will send you updates on our work as we file new cases or as we do things or as there are opportunities to be involved. And we would love to have you in our Democracy Forward community. So democracyforward.org, sign up. I love it. That is awesome. I will have all the information down in the show notes. Thank you so much, Sky. Thank you so much for this conversation. Thank Thanks for having me. Thank you so happy much. Fourth. And uh, happy fourth, I guess. Happy fourth. <laughs> don't, let, don't let this movement be your country. We need to be our country. Okay. Wow. Happy. Sky. You are the most in impressive guest I've ever had on Make this show. Make peach cobbler, get some ice cream, and register to vote. And register to vote. Don't let them win. Thank you, Sky. You are the best. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you again to Democracy Forward. Please consider making a donation to the cause through their website. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The opinions expressed on this podcast are not legal advice that can be relied on. They are based solely on the limited information provided. These opinions do not create any attorney-client relationship. Those seeking legal advice should contact an attorney in the appropriate jurisdiction and practice area.